Good morning, everyone. First, I want to take a moment to congratulate President, President Donald Trump on his historic win in Iowa, earning more votes than all the other candidates combined. The people of Iowa spoke loudly and clearly, echoing the sentiment felt throughout the rest of the country. America is rallying in support of President Trump to save America and fire Joe Biden. Yesterday, I had the honor of meeting with Israeli Ambassador Herzog. This past Sunday marked 100 days since the Hamas terrorist attacks against Israel, the bloodiest day for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. House Republicans will continue to stand unequivocally with Israel. House Republicans passed a robust aid package under Speaker Mike Johnson's leadership, and yet Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer continue to fail to deliver support to our most precious ally. This week, House Republicans will welcome hundreds of thousands of our constituents proudly participating in the March for Life. The most important and meaningful title I have ever had in my life is mom. We will continue to fight every day to ensure every baby has the sacred opportunity of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, life is under constant attack by radical far-left Democrats. There have now been over 88 recorded acts of violence and intimidation against pregnancy centers, churches, and pro-life organizations by far-left activists. These facilities were set ablaze, defaced, and vandalized. And what have we heard from Joe Biden and Democrats in Washington? Silence. Under the leadership of House Republicans, we passed the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act and a resolution condemning attacks on these pro-life facilities, groups, and churches following the Dobbs decision. In continuation of our commitment to defending life, this week House Republicans will bring to the floor the Pregnant Students' Rights Act and the Supporting Pregnant and Parenting Women and Families Act to support critical pregnancy resource centers and provide necessary information to pregnant students combating manipulation by the far left's radical pro-abortion agenda. With that, I am honored to introduce one of my colleagues and friends and another mom in Congress, Ashley Hinson from the great state of Iowa to discuss her bill on the floor this week. Ashley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, hello, everyone. It's great to be with you all um, straight off the Iowa caucuses. It was a busy couple of days, but um, I'm here today to talk about my bill, the Pregnant Student Rights Act. Uh, when Roe versus Wade was rightfully overturned last year, the next chapter of the pro-life movement began, began, and we were all given the opportunity to really strengthen our support for unborn babies and for new moms. And as a mom of two, this issue is very personal to me. When you're pregnant, there are a million questions going through your head and pregnant women should be surrounded with support and resources. Unfortunately, pregnant women on college campuses are often pressured to end their pregnancies or risk academic failure despite Title IX protections that are in place. Women should never be told that they have to choose between continuing their pregnancy or getting their degree. My Pregnant Student Rights Act ensures that pregnant women on college campuses know about existing protections that will allow them to both continue their pregnancy and their education so that they are empowered to create the best possible future for themselves and for their child. I look forward to passing this key pro-life legislation with the support of my colleagues this week, and together we can save more moms and save more babies. Thank you. We will now go to our colleague, Michelle Fishbach from Minnesota. Thank you very much. And I am excited to welcome all of those people who will be attending the March for Life this week. This administration is once again showing its true anti-women pro-abortion agenda. This time, the Department of Health and Human Services has proposed a rule trying to deter TANF funding away from pregnancy centers and toward facilities that provide abortions. Pregnancy centers support expectant mothers and their unborn children, offering a wide range of support for mothers and families, well aligned with the intended purposes of the TANF program. Singling out pregnancy centers is putting a political agenda ahead of thoughtful policy proposals that pre preserve state flexibility while balancing the need for accountability. That is why I introduced the Supporting Pregnant and Pre Parenting Women and Families Act to ensure pregnancy centers cannot be excluded or restricted from receiving TANF funding. Make no mistake, conservatives are here for unborn babies and their mothers. We want to ensure those moms are supported throughout their pregnancies and empowered to raise their children. 
Thank you. We'll now go to our whip, Tom Emmer. Last week, Hunter Biden further revealed the degree of his arrogance and entitlement. But when his press stunt at the Oversight Committee fell flat, reality seems to have set in. By the end of the week, Hunter Biden's lawyer had notified Chairman Comer and Jordan that he was ready to admit defeat after defying two lawfully issued subpoenas. As negotiations to arrange the date and time of his deposition continue, a few things should be made clear. House Republicans will continue to hold Hunter Biden's feet to the fire until we have his testimony. We have zero tolerance for his antics. He is a material witness in our inquiry. And sitting down in a formal deposition setting where all of our questions can be asked and answered is an important step in the fact-finding process. Don't just take my word for it. You'll recall that Democrats were adamant about the need for closed-door depositions prior to open hearings last Congress. If Hunter Biden tries to delay or pull another PR stunt, we can and will move forward with holding him in contempt. The fact of the matter is, this is about one thing only. And that is providing the American people with the transparency and accountability they deserve. We know Joe Biden has lied to the American people about his involvement in his son's business dealings over and over again. And it is very likely that he benefited from his family's corrupt business dealings as well. When we begin began this process, we promise to follow the facts wherever they lead. If Hunter Biden has nothing to hide, he will work with us to ensure the deposition happens swiftly. If he does go back on his word to appear for a closed door deposition, the full house will vote to remind him that no one, not even the president's son, is above the law. I'll turn it over now to our speaker, Mike Johnson. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all for being here. We had uh, a number of members of Congress who had to take planes, trains, and automobiles to make it to the Hill this week. So uh, lots of weather, lots of challenges, but we're glad everybody's back to work. Uh, This week, as has been mentioned, we will have hundreds of thousands of Americans who will also brave the weather and come here to Washington for the annual March for Life. And we're excited to welcome them here. Uh, We'll take this week, uh, as we do each year, to remember the value of every single human life and reiterate what we boldly proclaimed in our nation's birth certificate, that all men are created equal, all people are, and all life is sacred, and that governments are instituted to protect the rights given to us by our creator. That's what our our nation's birth certificate says. We believe that it's important to stand by families during unplanned pregnancies, and you heard uh, my colleagues here this morning articulate some of that. We want to make it easier for working mothers and and moms and dads to start and raise a family. And that's why House Republicans are voting on two pieces of legislation this week. You just heard them described here briefly, the Supporting Pregnant and uh, Parenting Women and Families Act and the Pregnant Students Rights Act. Across the country, uh, these pregnancy resource centers are doing heroic work. They're helping moms and and dads, especially low-income parents, as they deal with the realities of pregnancy and the challenges of raising children. Across the country, state governments rely on these centers to provide life-changing emotional and material support, and that's support that empowers parents to bring their children into the world. We want to make sure those centers continue and can continue to serve families in every state and are not needlessly cut out of the funding process by the Biden administration. And you heard exactly what's happening here with TANF funds and the rest. We also want to make sure that moms who are in college aren't presented with a false choice of being a mom or being a student. If an expecting mom is pursuing her degree, we want to make sure that, that uh, she knows that all the resources available to her so she can continue her studies, finish her degree while caring for her child. And those resources and that support is out there. House Republicans will continue to show the American people that we not only are a voice for the most vulnerable, but we also want to take action to protect them and their families. With that, uh, open it up for questions. Please. Chad. Good morning. Thank you. Happy New Year. You too question for you on this CR here. Are you confident that you'll be able to get more than half of the conference on board here? Because we keep hearing that there's a lot of people who are upset that you agreed to the top line, agreed to a CR when you said if you weren't going to do another CR yet, we're doing another CR. Yeah, I, I wanted uh, no more uh, CRs until we could move this process forward. We've, we've achieved that. We uh, forged forward. We got the top line agreement. And in spite of what 
people are saying on both sides, this is a better agreement than we had. We, we uh, Because of the adjustments that were made to the top line of 1.59, there was additional money that was spent, so we went in and carved it up. We got $16 billion in real cuts out of the IRS slush fund and the COVID slush fund that the Biden administration uh, was so jealously guarding and protecting. And that's that's an important improvement. We, we changed some of the gimmicks in those side deals, as they're called, into real savings for the American people. So having gotten the top line agreement now, this uh, allows us to go forward for the appropriators on both sides, both chambers, to work together and uh, and come up with the final bills. This, wait a minute, let me finish. And this is an important thing for us because it allows us to fight for our policy changes, our policy writers in those spending bills. And it takes time to do that. And so the reason we need just a little bit more time on the calendar is to allow that process to play out. This is what the American people expect and deserve. This is the way the law is supposed to work, where individual appropriations bills and not one big massive omnibus spending bill are, are duly negotiated and amended and, and, and the priorities fought for, and that's what we're doing. We just need a little more time on the calendar to do it, and that, that's why we are. But why aren't some of those conservatives convinced of this? I mean, they're, they're <clears throat> Well, I just left a, a, a conference meeting where we talked about this in detail, and, and uh, everyone understands the reality of where we are. Um, right now, as, as it sits, the House Republicans have uh, the second smallest majority in history. We have uh, 218 right now to 213 on the other side, and beginning next Monday, we'll be at 217. Um, literally the smallest uh, Republican majority in the history of the Congress and the second smallest of all time, rivaled only by the 65th Congress in 1917 uh, during World War I before women had the right to vote. The Democrats had a, a, a slightly smaller uh, uh, a smaller margin than us. but um, So that's the reality where we are. We're not going to get everything that we want, but we're going to stick to our uh, core conservative principles. We're going to advance fiscal stewardship. I regard this as a down payment on real reform that we're going to do in the budgeting process and with the budget going forward, and I think much, much brighter days are ahead. Jake. Uh, I guess two questions. Do you expect to, when this is done, do you expect to vote on 12 bills individually? That first question. Number two, you said in that meeting you hope there are victories ahead for House Republicans under this framework. We're not going to get everything we want, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what are, you, what are those victories? What do you see as doable, given the composition of that? Well, as, as you all know, we, we passed uh, over 80 percent of, of uh, government funding out of the House. Um, seven of those bills were passed off the floor. Uh, four more of them, of the 12, uh, made it through at least some final stage of uh, committee work. And so we have, we have stated our priorities on paper. We, we passed some very important measures in those appropriations bills that we sent to the Senate that have been sitting there collecting dust. I think uh, to date, I think the Senate has only did three of their own. So there, there's a lot of disagreement between the two chambers on what those policies are and what the, those priorities are. And that's what this process is about. Our, our, our appropriators and theirs get in a room, they roll up their sleeves and they arm wrestle over what those, uh, those differences are and they, they reach consensus. And so I'm very hopeful. Jake, to your point, I, I do hope that we have 12 separate appropriations bills. I believe there's time to get that done. Um, we'll see how this develops. I mean, certainly we're not going to have an omnibus, and that was a very important innovation for us to forge forward because it's no way to run a railroad. The reason we have $34 trillion in federal debt is because there's not been good stewardship in Congress for many, many years. Governing by omnibus is no way to do it. You can't assure stewardship and accountability and efficiency and effectiveness if you're lumping everything together in one giant bill. So having broken that up is a very important step. And what, what we're trying to do going forward is change the way Congress does this, to get back to the principles of the 19 74 uh, bu Budget Control Act, which has very specific deadlines where you do all this heavy, hard work in the spring and summer, you're done by the end of the summer, and you're not coming up on the September 30th deadline and in a fever pitch where everybody's worried about a government shutdown. We can do this better, and we're going to do every, we're going to use every ounce of energy we have to make sure that changes. Yes, sir. Do you believe that Joe Biden's presidency is God's will? <laughs> Is Joe Biden's presidency God's will? Oh, I know where you're going with this. Okay, so I, I said I said in my in my speech uh, before I took the gavel um, that look, I'm I'm a Bible believing Christian, right? Bible believing Christian believes what the Bible says, right? The Bible says that uh, God is the one that raises up people in authority. I believe God is sovereign. By the way, so did the founders. I quoted the Declaration of Independence. They acknowledge that our rights don't come from government; they come from God, and we're made in in, in His image. Everybody's made uh, the same. We all are, are, uh, are, are given equal uh, rights and value, and that's something that we defend. So if you believe all those things, uh, then you believe that um, God is the one that allows people to be raised in authority. Uh, it, it must have been God's will then. Uh, that's my belief, right? Uh, but uh, I think that, that um, 
that a, a nation uh, makes a decision collectively because we're given uh, the free will to do that, and I think we're going to make a much better choice as a country coming up in this election cycle. We're very much looking forward to that regime change. Yes, sir. Down Mr. Front Speaker, row. On the conversations are on the supplemental. Senator Lankford's made it clear that H.R. 2 will not pass the Senate. You're going to the White House today with a group of other leaders. Will your message be to President Biden that the House will not pass a supplemental package unless the HR2 principles are a part of it? Or is there room for negotiation around the border security measures? And do you believe the Senate has made progress in that regard? Um, well, we don't know exactly what the Senate has um, has come up with because we've not seen the text. We're anxious to see the text of what they've done. Um, th there's a lot of, I think, thoughtful and deliberate discussion and debate that's gone into this. It's a complex issue. I don't think now is the time for comprehensive immigration reform because we know how complicated that is. You can't do that quickly. I do think it's past time to secure the border. And that's what HRT reflects. Remember, we passed that bill more than eight, nine months ago now, and it's been sitting on the desk. HR2 had very important elements. Restore remain in Mexico policy, end catch and release, reform the asylum program, the broken parole process, rebuild the wall. Those elements are critically important. You can't choose from among those on a menu and assume that you're going to solve the problem. This is not a Republican talking point. Two, three weeks ago, I took 64 House Republicans down to the border. As you know, we went to Eagle Pass, the epicenter. We talked to the people on the ground. We talked to Border Patrol. We talked to the sheriffs of the counties on the border. We talked to the, the, the deputy chief of U.S. Border Patrol, who's a 33-year veteran of the agency. And they told us, and, and I've told you this before, they said the best metaphor. He said, we feel very much like at Border Patrol right now that we're administering an open fire hydrant. We don't need more buckets. We need to reduce the flow. We know how to reduce the flow. You have to have these elements involved. So we're not playing politics with this. We're demanding real, transformative policy change because that's what the American people need and deserve and that they're demanding as well. House Republicans are standing on that line. I will tell the president that today. I've been saying it consistently since the moment I was handed this president, gavel, and that's never changed. Nothing, sir? I, I don't care what you call it. I'm telling you that these elements are important in order to make the change that is necessary. No one should be playing politics with this. There's too much at stake. Fentanyl is the leading cause of death for Americans age 18 to 49. Trafficking is a scourge. The, 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 uh, the cartels on the border down there are making billions of dollars trafficking humans into the U.S. 60 to 70 percent of the people that cross at the Eagle Pass, which is the, the, the main funnel right now, are single adult males between the ages of 18 and 40. These are not huddled masses of families seeking refuge and asylum. These are people who come in here probably with ill design. Look, the human catastrophe cannot be overstated. The border is a catastrophe, and it has to be addressed. And you're going to see House Republicans standing and fighting on that hill because it's important for the country. Last well, last question. In the middle, we're here. Todd Cappensworth has noticed. I'm follow up on the meeting with Biden this afternoon. I'm wondering specifically expectations and what you're planning to tell him when it comes to funding for Ukraine. Uh, well, I'm going to tell him the same thing I've been saying from the beginning. Uh, with regard to Ukraine, we have needed, we have requested publicly, privately, in every forum, answers to the critical questions. What is the end game <clears throat> and the strategy in Ukraine? How will we have accountability for the funds? Um, we, we need to know that Ukraine would not be another Afghanistan. And you see a lot of the American people having real, scratching their heads, having real questions about um, why that would continue without these appropriate answers. So I'm going to push for those. But before we even talk about Ukraine, I'm going to tell the president what I'm telling all of you and we've told the American people, border border, border. We have to take care of our own house. We have to secure our own border before we talk about doing anything else. And that's the, the message I've had since day one. It's the message we'll continue to have. And, and I think that's the message the American people want us to deliver. I told that to the president um, myself on, a on the telephone. We had a 30-minute phone call, I think, Thursday of last week. And I look forward to seeing him in person again to deliver it personally. Thank you all for the time this morning. We appreciate it.